Okay, so good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our ongoing criminal computation neuroscience seminar series. Um, I hope everybody had a nice long weekend and staying safe and healthy. Um, as you know, we've been doing this for some, some years now, and we've been doing it virtually now for a couple of years. Um, so, I mean, there's pros and cons. We're able to have wonderful speakers like our speaker today. Um, so today, I'm very happy to welcome Yulia Georgieva. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome. She's you said uh, she's in computational neuroscience, but I would I would say she's emerging leader, if not a leader already in the field. Um, you know, in sort of this interdisciplinary field, which you know we all sort of you know try to sort of coordinate in different ways. And so just a little bit of background before I turn the floor over to her. Um, so she started off in mathematics um, at Harvey Mudd uh, College in uh, Claremont, California, before moving on to a PhD. Um, in computational neuroscience at Cambridge. Then she did postdoctoral training at Brandeis, wonderful place, um, and Harvard, another wonderful place. Um, and along the way, she had many notable awards, for example, Schwartz Foundation Postdoc and the Burroughs Welcome Career Award, and so on. And now she's um, a Max Planck Research Group Leader at Frankfurt and moving to a professor position in the Technical University of Munich. And so we got her at a good time and I'm really happy we managed to coordinate this because you know these are challenged times we live in. Um, but as I sort of summarized um, from what Yulia, uh, Yulia sent me, um, her research work sort of involves many things, but just to sort of summarize it as, as, as she has on our KCN Hub website is um, the field of neuroscience involves many things, but really she's uh, interested in investigating organization and computation in neural circuits, how they emerge during development, as, she, as she's written, and then how they're maintained throughout learning into adulthood. So these are large challenges, but we clearly need to sort of have this integration of theoretical computational work with the experimental studies. And so before I turn the floor over to her, I really want to sort of share one of the favorite lines that I've used, and you guys are all aware of it, but not everybody in the audience may be, and so I'm going to sort of cite it. So many papers, many publications, of course, Yulia has that you guys will hear some of the more recent work today. Um, but basically, for those of you who are sort of in this, this math computational field, what she has said is the following. Um, how do we know what biophysical details matter for circuit performance? I mean, of course, there's you know, no obvious answer to that, but really the challenge at present is it's unclear where the inflection point describing model complexity and increased understanding lies. And if you use detailed models, simple models, you know, there's, there's pros and cons. And so this sort of inflection point idea from calculus, I just love because it really sort of points to this sort of you know, trying to find that inflection point. And so um, it, it's it's sort of fantastic, you know, having people like Yulia in the field because, you know, she really sort of, you know, challenges that point. And, and we'll hear about that today. And, and I'm glad that she has a full time to share because when we were together at the Allen Institute workshop talk, I mean, there's just not enough time to share everything. So um, I will turn the floor over and also welcome questions. I'll watch with the chat. I mean, she's fine to be interrupted. Um, but of course, we'll have the end too. So welcome, Yulia, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Francis, for that really kind and generous introduction. I'm really uh, excited to be here. Can you see my screen? Everything yes. looks good to you? Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah um, it's really great to be here. And yes, we, we chose uh, the right time to reschedule, but it, it's totally fine uh, right after the a long weekend. But I'm really happy to see a very nice and cozy audience. So honestly, feel free to interrupt me at any time to ask me any kind of questions that you have about anything. Um, uh, I'm, I decided to do a little bit of an a, unusual approach. So normally when I give these talks, I choose to present uh, usually two of our most recent uh, works published or recently preprinted. And uh, what happens is I'm usually rushed and I don't have time to finish certainly the second topic. But what I decided to do this time is to focus fully on one of the stories that we recently po uh, posted on, on the bioarchive last year and is currently in review. So I'm really happy to hear any kind of feedback or comments um, on this. And hopefully I have the chance to explain uh, a lot of the work that we did um, in detail. So really feel free to interrupt me. Uh, 
So um, as Francis mentioned, uh, we in my group are interested in how neural circuits become organized, so how they build up their connectivity uh, in order to execute diverse computations and behaviors, and especially in very, very early stages of uh, development through mechanisms of synaptic and intrinsic plasticity. Also in adulthood, how animals learn to reorganize their connectivity as they experience stimuli from the external uh, world um, around us. So in very much, uh, in very many of the um, questions that we ask in my group, we're interested in uh, this puzzle, this dilemma, or this challenge that neural circuits have to constantly implement and maintain. And that is the challenge of flexibility versus stability. So flexibility here refers exactly to this process of constant reorganization, constant development, turnover of synaptic strands and spines and um, um, experiences that really make the circuits basically evolve in time as a function of the experiences um, of the animal. But of course, the other important part is stability, because if these circuits are constantly changing and turning over, then no memories can be uh, reinforced, no experiences can actually be uh, solidified. And we think of this question as one of the core questions in, in neuroscience. Um, so as I mentioned in a lot of the work that we do that will actually not be the focus of today's talk, we're interested in understanding the plasticity of the synaptic connections um, in circuits in development and learning. So here, just for illustration, I have indicated, or denoted or illustrated um, a pyramidal neuron, let's say the cortex or in hippocampus, we usually actually study the cortex um, in my group which is basically bombarded by different types of synaptic connections from the surrounding network. So these synaptic connections can be from other excitatory pyramidal neurons indicated here with the blue triangles, as well as from inhibitory neurons indicated here by the, uh, the red circles. And they, as we know, are extremely plastic. The number, the strength of these synaptic connections can really change, as I said, during development and uh, during adulthood and learning in response to experience. Um, so we have studied different types of mechanisms that govern the change in these, uh, in the number and the strengths of these connections, so-called learning rules or synaptic plasticity mechanisms. Um, and here I just, I've just mentioned um, some of them. So mechanisms of excitatory plasticity or inhibitory plasticity, the different types of synapses. But um, as we know, these mechanisms are not sufficient. So while they enable these circuits to be flexible and to learn new things and to reorganize, they are basically not sufficient to ensure the stability. So on their own, they cannot um, explain the activity dependent, de uh, dependent development of neural circuits because they tend to destabilize the activity uh, of the neural circuit. So if you, I didn't mention the word HEB, but basically what we study are mechanisms of avian plasticity that use correlated pre and post synaptic activity. So basically coactivation of these presynaptic inputs and the post synaptic neuron to basically increase the strength of these synaptic connections. Uh, this is a positive feedback process, which, so if we now think of these neurons as being part of the network, tends to increase the strength of the connections between the neurons in this network. And this tends to increase the activity, which again, given that you have this higher activity means you can drive the, um, the neurons, the inputs more, which will further increase your strengths. And therefore you have basically um, blowing up of the connections in the network as well as the, the activity. So, but of course we know this is not what happens in real brain circuits. Real brain circuits are incredibly um, um, uh, stable. Uh, they are capable of managing and regulating their activity as well as the dynamics of these connections between the neurons. And they possess many different types of mechanisms that can do this. And so in some of our work, we have studied so-called heterosynaptic plasticity mechanisms that operate both with excitatory and inhibitory synapses. These are ones that are not activated during the typical induction of plasticity. So normally you activate a certain set of synapses and then you measure the strength of the connections to the postsynaptic neuron. This is what classically is called homosynaptic plasticity is what most labs study. But recently experimentalists have identified this other form known as heterosynaptic plasticity where you observe plasticity even at synapses that are not directly involved um, in this plasticity induction protocol that changes the activity. And we have some, some, some work published in this paper field at all that, that argues 
what these types of uh, heterosynaptic plasticity mechanisms might be useful for in terms of regulating activity in these networks. So for example, in this particular work, we argue that the heterosynaptic plasticity at both excitatory inhibitory synapses is responsible for maintaining a balance between excitation and inhibition in the network in some desirable range. And so we think that maybe as the animal is learning and is trying to sort of balance this flexibility stability um, issue, um, there are periods when it can sort of change the CI balance into more positive or more negative um, uh, regimes. And this enables uh, a learning for just a short period of time without, um, in, uh, without allowing blow up. Um, but what I want to focus on today is a, a related but slightly different take on this puzzle that neural circuits have to solve of flexibility versus stability. Um, and the puzzle that I want to address today is actually the, the puzzle or the, again, the duality between noise versus reliability. So in some sense, what I'd like to argue today is that the brain is indeed very flexible and can perform different computations, but it does so in the presence of large amounts of noise that can come in the circuit either externally from the external world or that are generated intrinsically in the circuits. And so we think that this noise in some sense provides some kind of flexibility that enables the circuits to learn and to express these different types of uh, computations. Um, and so this, in the presence of this noise, it is still possible that, um, that these, these neural circuits are capable of generating reliable computations and, and um, that are robust to noise. So um, to kind of motivate this, I want to give you, you've probably all seen this or read this paper and are aware of this example, but I want to highlight it as one of the key uh, studies um, I published now, I don't know, a long time ago, almost 30 years ago, that kind of touched a little bit upon this issue of the importance of noise and reliability. So this is an experiment done by Zach Minen and Terry Senovsky in 95, where they patched neurons uh, in the slices of ratomasoma somatosensory cortex and injected two different types of current into these cells and then measured the response in multiple trials. First, they injected this constant step current, so basically no fluctuation in the current, and examined basically the spiking, the, the action potentials um, of the uh, cell that received this input current over multiple trials. So we see the membrane potential superimposed of the different trials at the top, and then at the bottom, we see the, the action potentials generated by the same cell over multiple trials. And you see that the cell initially reacts very, very precisely by timing its first spike very precisely to the injection of the current, but very quickly over this period of one second, the intrinsic noisy properties of the cell, whatever they may come from, um, completely jitter the spikes and generate this, this sort of noisy looking response. However, so perhaps surprisingly or paradoxically, when, um, when uh, the experimentalists here injected a noisy current, but again, uh, same over multiple trials, uh, so this is a pseudo-random uh, current, they saw that in fact, over multiple trials, the response of the cell in terms of the membrane potential, but also the spikes that one can extract from this membrane potential was incredibly stereotyped. So this means that the cell is actually able to respond with outstanding precision in terms of the spike times, despite the fact that the stimulus is noisy. So what is going on here? How can, how can neural systems, you know, on one hand, uh, obviously show this amount of noise, but on the other hand, be very precise and, and reliable? Um, so we want to address this problem. We want to take this beyond the single cell level because in the single cell level, this reliability, as I just showed you, is estimated. So you take the cell, you present the stimulus multiple times, you record the response, and you basically look at the variability. But but it's very difficult to understand, you know, where this variability comes from, and and is it, you know, the single cell level, and how does this implicate what happens in the network? So here we want to actually understand what this reliability, so this uh, in terms of computations, in terms of propagation or of activity, um, how can it be realized despite the presence of noise? And in the case, not of single neurons, but of an entire network of, no, of uh, recurrently connected neurons, as is the case in the cortex. So we're going to take the cortex as an example of a network where obviously noise is present from external and internal sources. And we're going to try to understand how um, in the presence of this noise, reliable 
um, propagation of activity and reliable computations can be, can be implemented. And we think the cortex is especially interesting because we know it's re heavily recurrently connected. Uh, there's multiple streams of information, both bottom up and top down that intersect to generate these uh, diverse computations. So um, we, in most of the projects in my group, we actually work with experimentalists to understand processing, sensory processing in mammalian uh, cortices, especially uh, rodents, because that's one of the model organisms that has been studied a lot. But in this particular case, we actually collaborated with a lab that was just nearby. So we've been hearing a lot of talks that they gave in, at our institute, at all the local institute seminars, and were very inspired by some of their results and especially the accessibility of the tissue and the experiments that they could do that our other colleagues could not do in the uh, mammalian cortex. And this is actually the cortex of the turtle. So these experiments were done in the lab of Gilles Laurent. Uh, they were published a few years ago um, in the cortex of turtles. So they were done in, um, under ex vivo conditions where the experimentalists can actually take out an entire slab of cortex and keep it in a dish for a really long time. So this is of course not um, as ideal as in vivo, but it's extremely uh, more uh, realistic than, than a slice or a culture because it, you basically have the entire tissue, nothing has been cut up or, or sliced. So basically all the connections are there. Um, and this cortex is, um, has some advantages uh, in the sense that it's relatively primitive uh, because it has a simpler architecture than the six layered mammalian cortex. This, uh, in this case, we're talking about the visual cortex. It only consists of three layers. So the three layers are the inhibitory, the excitatory layer, and then there's a top layer that consists primarily of neuropil. And in that sense, the visual cortex in these turtles corresponds or can be matched to the olfactory cortex uh, in mammals or even, or even the hippocampus with the three layers that it has. But the really uh, important advantage of the system is that it can, um, it can be used for very long experiments because these slabs of, of uh, turtle cortex tissue can be studied intact for a very long time. So the type of experiments they did in this case um, what was to put a, a large multi-electrode array that covered about two by two millimeter tissue um, that recorded the activity of the entire population of excitatory and inhibitory neurons in this uh, turtle cortex slab. And they, uh, they, in this case, the PhD student in, in the Laurent department, Mike Hemberger, injected individual uh, small amounts of current in individual excitatory cells, so in the excitatory layer, that were sufficient to invoke either one or two action potentials. So just a little bit of current to inject to, to generate these spikes, these single spikes in the excitatory cells. And then using the multi-electrode array, they recorded the activity in the entire population of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And so here's basically two such trials. So two spikes here indicated by, by the blue uh, uh, line uh, were injected into an excitatory cell. Um, and what we see here are neurons in this network of excitatory and inhibitory uh, neurons that responded over two separate trials. And so what is key here, what I want you to notice is that these neurons are ordered in exactly the same way in these two separate trials. And obviously they did this multiple times. And what they observed was that they, they tend to, they tend to um, fire in exactly the same order across different trials. Um, from now on, I also want you to notice that I'm going to use the color red to indicate inhibitory neurons or inhibitory spikes and blue to indicate excitatory neurons. So they identified a mechanism, which I'll explain in a moment, to basically quantify the, what they call the reliability of this response of exactly the same neurons over multiple trials. Um, they even call them sequences. So you see that these neurons always fire with approximately the same timing with some, some variability, so some, some jitter uh, from trial to trial, but approximately they fire with the same order and the same timing uh, across different trials. And they call them followers. So these are follower cells that activate in this same order and same timing in response to the activation of the same cell across, across multiple trials. So what we wanted to understand is 
basically the implications. What, it, what are the mechanisms, first of all, of the generation of these uh, sequences? So how do these follower cells end up being reliably activated in the same order and in the same timing following the activation of a single spike? So um, in, in, in a single excited neuron. So what is the mechanism that enables these sequences to generate? We then wanted to understand sort of to quantify their robustness or their reliability. I mean, already from these two trials, you can see that they're somewhat robust, somewhat reliable, but not precisely, right? So some, some cells, you know, can, can, can omit or can, can fail to fire in particular trials. Um, and importantly, we wanted to, you know, go beyond what the data uh, tells us. So we use the data to constrain our models, but we want to be able to say a lot more about the mechanisms of these, uh, of how these sequences are generated and at least speculate about their functional relevance, which is a bit difficult to assay in these ex vivo circuits. Is there a question? Yes, for yes. me. Um, yes. So I just want to make sure, like, so yeah. you, you know, these two, you said it's the same ordering in multiple trials. So yes. I just want to know exactly what I should be focusing on because yeah, so I see the blue, which is obviously you're sort of simulating. Yes, yes. Simulating. So then what is the sequence? Just the fact that it's, you know, like sort of a phase procession type. Well, it's not phase procession, but what what is repeatable? Because depending on, I'm not sure what I should be focusing on. Yeah, there. so so I, I show here only two trials, but they really did many, many, many trials. And so okay. if they do many, many trials, so I don't have a, I actually have it later. So the, the mechanism by which this is how we also do this in the, in the, in the model. So uh, there's a single spike that's injected in this reference cell, and then the population activity of all the excitatory and inhibitory neurons is recorded. And then to identify whether neurons participate in the sequence and whether to call them followers or not, what, what they did, the experimentalists did, and then what we do in our model is to basically compare the activity after in the network, after the injection of this uh, reference spike, this trigger spike, relative to the activity before the trigger spike. Okay. And so we do a very simple statistical test to make sure that uh, there are some cells or that the population activity in, uh, after the injection of the spike is elevated. And if the cells pass that statistical test, then we call them followers. Okay. And so what okay. we see is that, in, so yeah, here in, in our model networks where we have a lot more neurons than in the data, because in the data, they can only record so many with the multi-electrode arrays, you see that, I mean, they are ordered in time. So indeed the, the trigger one is the first one that spikes and then the rest of the spikes follow. But what, what you can see um, is that, you know, it's always, hopefully this becomes clear later on, but it is important that we get it across now that it's always, let's say, uh, the purple one fires and then if we kind of label the neurons one two three four five we see that neuron one fires neuron through two fires in all the trials and then maybe in half of the trials neuron three fires but in the other half of the trials neuron three doesn't fire but a different neuron labeled neuron four fires um, and then and so on so there is some stereotypy in the sense that there could be let's say neurons one and two that fire in all the trials but there is also a little bit of flexibility because there could also be other cells that fire in some probability fraction of the trials, but not in the others. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. Thank you. But Thank there you. is, yeah, yeah. I think that, yeah, this is important to, to get across. I think it's a bit hard to, to realize here because there are not so many cells and there's only a few trials, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. And, and, and actually I hope you can also, I can maybe mention it now already, but uh, one of the caveats uh, where we wanted to build a network model of this is one of the caveats here is that in the, um, because of by design in the experiments, when they put the multi-electrode array, they primarily record from the inhibitory population because these neurons are closer to the MEA. Um, so they record very few, they record some, but they record very few excitatory cells. And in fact, in these examples, there are no excitatory cells that they record from. They, they, I only show here inhibitory cells. Um, and so, you know, whatever the experimentalists can say about how these sequences or how this activity propagates triggered by these single spikes is heavily limited to the inhibitory population that they record. And so we wanted to yeah, go beyond and say something also about the excitatory population. 
All right. And I have this slide just to tell you that um, um, because I, I sometimes get asked, ah, you know, why, why the turtle cortex? It's an unusual species and so on. And I think this is less a question for myself because we do computational and theoretical work when we're really interested in sort of principles of sequence propagation by these single spike triggers. Um, and so I just want to convince you, um, I think this is more of a job that Jill has to do of why turtle cortex is interesting, but I want to convince you that there are other sequences in other brain areas and other organisms. So I give you here an example from uh, recordings in the um, uh, somatosensory cortex. This is in, in rodents, in the awake auditory cortex. Here they use a very interesting measure that they call, uh, what do they call it? The center of mass of the scaled triggered uh, cross correlelogram. So it's just a measure to determine how precise the spikes are during these different conditions of sustained activity, spontaneous activity, or the onset of a tone in the auditory cortex. Um, and then of course the turtle cortex experiments, which, which I just described for you. So there are indeed sequences also doing replay, right? Of, of uh, when animals now, this is a hot topic at the moment when they traverse, traverse um, a certain areas, there's replay of um, different types of place cells in the hippocampus. So these sequences are really everywhere. So as I mentioned to you, we, we, we were puzzled by these data because they, uh, you know, we wanted to kind of dig deeper into the mechanistic insights of how one can generate these uh, sequences from these single uh, spike triggers. And we were especially um, pleasantly surprised by how much detail we could extract from the data that would allow us to sort of constrain our models in a, you know, much more than we could uh, from, from mammalian data. So this is what we did. So this was work by my really talented PhD student, Luis Riquelme, who is uh, hopefully graduating soon and is going to be on the postdoc job market. So he worked very closely with the experimentalist Mike Hemberger to uh, extract some set of parameters from the data that through various sets of investigations, we determined to be most important for the sequences. And he built a network model of excitatory inhibitory neurons with uh, spatially localized connectivity. So we have connectivity that decays spatially with a given probability that we took from the experimental data uh, because Mike actually did a lot of uh, recordings to estimate how far this connectivity spreads in space. Um, what is a bit different than models that we and maybe you built of the mammalian cortex, where we typically have an 80-20 proportion of excitation inhibitory cells. Here we have many fewer inhibitory cells, about 7%. And the other thing that's important is that the connectivity within these locally dense, uh, locally um, yeah, uh, patches of tissue that are uh, connected with high probability is very dense. So, so we have this about 50% connectivity to connect between an excitatory and inhibitory neuron in these locally dense patches. So this is again different than classical models that, that we build, for example, like Brunel uh, networks where connectivity is very sparse, usually about 10%. So that's kind of one, one important aspect. And the other important aspect is the strengths of the connections in these networks. So here we actually used, again, data to constrain these connections. So we actually had data primarily from excitatory to excitatory neurons and excitatory to inhibitory neurons, but we extended this to also apply to inhibitory neurons. And the important thing, so here's the data, is that the uh, probability uh, density function here is very, very long tailed. So we have many, many connections that are very weak, but we have few connections so, uh, that are very strong. So we have sparse and strong connectivity and dense and weak connectivity. And some of these, I think the strongest connection that was recorded was is basically sufficient to raise the membrane potential. So if you inject a spike by this connection, it's sufficient to increase the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron completely from rest uh, to firing. Um, and so we assumed such connections to exist between all types of connections, even though these long tails were only measured for two of the connections that involved the excitatory cells. Um, so we assumed also this to apply to the inhibitory cells. And again, there's actually quite a bit of data about long tail distributions, either of synaptic connection strengths now that are extracted using EM techniques or electron microscopy. Um, and so this is not such an unrealistic assumption. So those were, those were the big, several big assumptions in the model. So spatially dense connectivity with these long tails, 
of connection strengths. And other than that, most of the, most of the other uh, parameters or the other uh, connectivity profiles in the network were assumed to be, to be random. So there was no other structure applied um, in the network. So we like to call the net, we like to describe these networks as being minimally, uh, minimally structured or so they're ra otherwise random, but they're sort of minimally biologically inspired. So this is what the activity looks like if we look at several snapshots in time. So we do have these sort of spatial temporally propagating bumps of activity. But the important thing for us is, first of all, to see whether this, uh, this biologically constrained model of these parameters we got from the turtle cortex. So we also fitted, I should say, some single neuron properties like the membrane resistance of the cell, the time constants, and um, uh, the adapt adaptivity. The cells tend to be actually adaptive. And then we wanted to see whether, first of all, we can, we can generate or reproduce the sequences that exist in the experimental data. So we did exactly the same protocol and exactly the same characterization is in the experiment. So we injected a single spike in one excitatory cell and then measured the activity before and after the spike injection in the population. And depending on whether this was statistically elevated relative to the activity before the spike injection of this trigger spike, we um, called the neurons um, after the injection of the respond after uh, to the injection of the spike. We called them followers, and we assumed that they participate in these sequences evoked by the trigger spike. So um, we are doing this um, in the model, so we can of course control the overall activity in the network. We uh, assumed that there was a very very small random current that drove all the neurons in the networks with, where we could regulate both the mean and the standard deviation just to, to allow the network to be uh, active. And again, I should say this is very different than classical models, Brunel and so on, because the activity here is extremely low. So we can modulate these properties and generate two scenarios that I call low and high activity simulation. What I mean by low activity simulation, I mean average firing rates of 0.01 hertz. And what I mean by high activity simulation is 0.1 hertz. Very different than 10 to 100 hertz that are generated in sort of more classical uh, networks that we usually model to describe the mammalian cortex. Um, why did we do this? Because at least in this ex vivo experiments in the turtle cortex, uh, we know that the firing rates in the, in the network are very low, so about 0.01 hertz. And we also consider this additional scenario of high activity uh, drive, high activity simulations of about 0.1 hertz, which actually correspond to in vivo measurements that the same group has measured um, in a different set of experiments. So we can capture, I hope you can see using this method, we can indeed see that under these conditions of low activity simulation that correspond to the ex vivo experiments, we can capture sequences very nicely. So these are two different trials. These are the neurons that respond to the two different trials with significantly elevated activity post trigger spike. And we can uh, basically say that these sequences uh, these follower cells also generate this reliable activity, even under high activity simulation, in some sense, making a prediction that we would expect to see these sequences also in vivo, if they could do these experiments in vivo as well, which, which they are currently doing, not in the turtle, but in the lizard brain. Um, but I hope what you can see from these two um, examples of low and high activity stimulation is that the composition of the cells that participate in the sequence is a little bit different. So in the low activity simulation, we have uh, a mixture of red and blue. Remember, blue is excitation, red is inhibition. So we basically have both excitatory and inhibitory neurons that are follower cells that participate in these sequences. But in the high activity simulation, we primarily have excitatory cells. And at least with the current ex vivo experiments, this is very difficult to obtain because as I said, the MEA, the multi electrode arrays closer to the inhibitory cells, so very, very few excitatory cells are being recorded. But, and you can also see that these uh, sequences look very different. Um, and so we can sort of quantify this. We can look at the number of followers, which are these cells that reliably take part in the sequences as a function of this overall drive or overall firing in the network. Um, so for the excitatory cells, we see that this number of followers, so number of cells that participate in the sequences increases 
as you increase the overall drive in the network um, and then gradually decreases, but it doesn't drop to zero. So even in networks where this sort of current that we inject to drive the neurons, to drive the network, which you could think of it basically as noise because it's uncorrelated, even in cases when that's very, very high, we still expect to see sequences compri comprised of excitatory followers, um, of about 10 excitatory followers. But the opposite is true for the inhibitor neurons. Here, when you increase the drive to the network, you basically drive the network to be so, so noisy that you completely eliminate the participation of these inhibitory cells as followers in these sequences. And I have indicated here with these horizontal black lines, the ranges that were recorded in ex vivo and in vivo uh, conditions, the firing rates that were recorded. And so you see that there's a little bit of overlap um, but it seems to be that these ex vivo uh, conditions where the firing rates around 0.01 hertz are somehow, I don't know, optimal, or I don't know if you want to call them optimal, but they seem to be in some, some optimal state where you expect to see the largest numbers of followers. I don't know if this is coincidence or uh, something that, that is uh, really the case here. Um, okay, so we were curious about now the main drive beyond behind the generation of these sequences. So what determines whether these sequences will be generated or not? And perhaps you already suspect what the main driver here is. And the main driver here seems to be the strong connections. Uh, but it's not as simple as that. But let me first explain why this makes sense and, and why yeah, it is the way it is. So we, we built this, we have this full network model where here I indicate with this uh, probability distribution, the entire distribution of connections. So many, many weak connections and few strong connections. So here the weak connections are indicated with the blue arrows and the strong connections with the orange arrows. And here for this full model, we can calculate the number of followers in many different uh, instantiations or simulations. And then we run two control networks, one in which we eliminate all the weak connections and only keep about 0.3% of the strongest connections. So this very, very far part, uh, far right part of the tail of the connections. And another model where we eliminate most of the strong, connect, uh, most of the strong connections, right? And we keep about 91% of the weakest connections in the network. And you see that, the presence of strong connections is really sufficient to explain the number of followers that are seen in these networks. So the only strong connection model, even though many of the weak connections have been eliminated, can generate almost the same number of followers, in some cases even more than the full model. And in the weak uh, case of weak connections, you completely eliminate all the followers. But this is not to say that the weak connections don't actually play a role in the network. And so to 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 show you for the rest of the talk, to convince you that the weak connections also play a role. Um, we first just looked at the overall activation in the network. So we computed the FI curves. So these are the curves that tell us what the firing rate as a function of current are in the network in both of these cases. So for the full model with full connectivity and the model with only strong connectivity. And so you see here that Indeed, the weak connections do contribute to raise the activity to overall higher firing rates um, in the network. So without the weak connections, you don't actually reach the same firing rates in the full model. But what is kind of important is this, this bottom plot here. We've actually subtracted uh, the number of followers for the full versus the only strong model as a function of this input current. So the kind of the overall input current in the networks. And so what you see is there's it's sort of like a stochastic resonance effect. There seems to be some optimal level of drive in the network where you really see an increase in the number of followers. So obviously, if you have very little current in the network, you just have no activity, so no followers. Then if you increase the amount of current, you start to see an increase in the number of followers. And then if you continue increasing uh, the current, you end up basically driving the network in a noisy state, and then you, you will see less and less you will see far fewer followers than in the in the full model so it's almost like i i don't know if we should use the word stochastic resonance but it's some some special intermediate state of, of drive that enables the sort of the optimal drive in the network that enables the generation of these of these followers which kind of corresponds to this peak here 
uh, that we already showed for the excitatory followers in the population. So are there any urgent questions here? Um, I'm going to, OK, I hope yeah, people actually, I, 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 I wanted. Yes, yes. I, I just wanted to confirm a couple of things. You mentioned um, your cellular models matching the data in some way. And, and so I don't either I missed it or you didn't specifically say what your model was mathematically. Like yes, we use mm -hmm. we use an adaptive exponential integrate and fire model. Okay, okay. And we and modeled, so yeah, the Brett model, and we uh, took the adaptation indices from the data, and okay. we also matched the time constant. So we tried to fit based on current clamp uh, measurements. We tried to fit some of the time constants and then the adaptivity of the cells. Okay, and then the other thing, just to confirm, so when you talk about the input current that's into like all the cells in the network. Okay, all right. And it's uncorrelated. So there's a mean drive, some DC current, and then some some fluctuations. Okay, so no differentiation between excitatory inhibitory. Okay. No, no, we basically have the same the same okay. drive. In them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you, we can argue if this is a realistic assumption or not. I know from some mammalian circuits. Uh, yeah. They, they have to be made different. Okay, so I'm now done with the reproducing. So I don't know, I hope, I hope you're convinced, but this, this, this part of the presentation was just to convince you that we have a model that can capture these sequences as the data, and it can give us a little bit more insight into what generates the sequences, that they are primarily made of excited neurons, especially if you raise the activity in the networks. And there's this sort of sweet spot of a kind of drive in the networks where these sequences are mostly pronou most pronounced and that it's the strong connections that uh, that uh, drive them that generate the sequences but let's actually push this and and make the, just open the box and see what this model can actually tell us about the mechanism or further implications about what this could mean for the capacity of these networks to do interesting things so we were we we next wanted to investigate what what makes these sequences? Are they kind of, you saw that they're reliable, but there's still like some gaps. And so here are three trials. So there's an example of, again, this is the trigger neuron, this purple cell, this is the spike of that trigger cell. And then these are three different trials of the excitatory inhibitor neurons that are activated in this network. What I've, you know, we, we are doing this in, a, in silico, right? So we have full access to the connectome. And so here I've indicated all the cells that I've, uh, called follower cells via our statistical um, method, statistical test method that are indicated here in the three trials. And I've moreover color coded some of the connections between them with light blue, the weak connections and with orange, the strong connections. So these are in the, the top, whatever, 0.3% of the strongest connections in the network. Um, and so this is always the same trigger cell. And you see that there's reliability in the sense that again the same kind of at least these first few cells are always getting activated at the same time but then the sequence becomes a little bit more distinct so there seems to be some gaps here that are not there in the first and third trial so it's reliable but there's also a little bit of differences which we think are signature of this flexibility so let me explain how so what we can do is we can do unbiased clustering of these uh, sequences to see if they're composed of modules. And so we do that. So we line up the followers as well as the trials. So the followers are the cells and the trials are the multiple trials that we do. So we really have a lot of trials, not just the few that I show you here. And then we just sort them. So here we use K modes clustering. And we identify, in this case, three different clusters. So this purple cluster, sorry, the, the brown cluster, the orange and the green. So we can color code the spikes. And so you see that there are some trials like the ones uh, here indicated by this arrow where both of the orange and the green uh, um, sub modules or modules get activated. Then there's some where it's just the orange and there's some where it's just the green. And then of course there's, there's a few trials where it's, it's a bit of a mi mi mixture. Um, and as I said, because we, we're doing this in silico, we also have access to the entire connectome, we can map this clustering that we obtained purely from the activity, and this is key, right? Here we only use the activity and we use no knowledge about the connectivity, but now that we can identify these effective, we call them subsequences, we can map them to this connectivity because we know exactly which are the neurons that participate, that generate these orange versus the neurons that generate these green spikes. So we can color code them 
And we actually see that they correspond to sparse branches of strong connections. In other words, these orange subsequences, so the neurons that, that generate this orange colored subsequence are in fact a branch of strongly connected neurons. Similarly, these neurons that, that generate these green spikes, again, are part of a, a branch of uh, sparse but strong connectivity that, that is colored here in green. And so in some sense, we, we can, we can uh, have this, this um, possibility, I guess, capacity to propagate information independently through these different branches. Um, we think of this as a capacity for a routing of information through the network. So I just want to remind you, it's not, this is not the full connectome that I'm showing you. This is just the connectome of the very strongest connections. There are, of course, many, many weak connections between the neurons. But these subsequences can be mapped to these sparse, strong connections that generate these uh, so-called branches or subnetworks. So now we want to understand whether this, the, indeed, these branches provide a substrate to route information through one or the other branch um, independently. So, for example, can we decide? or can the network, the circuit, decide whether to send information just through the green or just through the orange branch? And the answer in some sense uh, is yes. So uh, to do this, we identify so-called gate neurons. So we identify these neurons to be the ones that respond first in the entire branch upon the activation of the trigger cell shown here in orange. And we uh, now want to investigate what the capacity is of these gates to indeed control or route information individually through these different branches. So let's just do this in a controlled manner. Let's take one such gate, for example, the gate to this green branch, and let's inject by hand excitatory, so depolarizing or inhibitory hyperpolarizing current just into the gate. Unsurprisingly, if we inject excitatory neuron into this gate, so here's the trigger, uh, here's this, this, following the trigger, there's this purple cell that, uh, this brown cell that activates, and then immediately you go into the green branch and this gate. And so now if we just give it a slight kick, so slight excitatory depolarizing current, we can ensure propagation through the entire green branch. Unsurprising, right? You drive this gate and then you have activity going through the branch. Similarly, we can halt activity. So normally you might have activity propagating through the branch, but if you now uh, actually inject a hyperpolarizing or inhibitory current into this gate, you can now completely halt the propagation through this gate. So this is all fine. Uh, this is perhaps unexpected, unex uh, um, but we also wanted to you know, put this in a more realistic context as this as this um, gate, as this little, um, these two branches that are, you know, they're not isolated, they're actually part of the big network, and they're not experiencing these fixed currents whose amplitude and timing we can we control here because we're doing the experiments in silico, but they're actually part of a network. And so they're, experience, they're experiencing constant bombardment from their other synaptic partners. Okay, so before I actually show you what they do in the network, uh, we here actually explore the magnitude and the timing of the input into these gates. Because here we just injected like a very, very strong depolarizing or hyperpolarizing input, and we saw that this can enhance or halt propagation in the network. But now let's actually change the magnitude and the timing. So the timing is shown on the x-axis, the magnitude is shown on the y-axis. And we identify three different regimes. Maybe I actually start with the last regime. We have a regime of halting, where if we inject this current into the, um, uh, the gate, into the green branch, if this input is inhibitory uh, and is injected prior to when this branch would normally activate, so when this input is, for example, not injected, we see, again, non-surprisingly, a very strong halting effect. We have another effect where we now inject excitatory current into this, uh, into this gate cell. And again, we see facilitation. So the, in the injection of this current for some range of amplitude and some range of timing, which actually spills over also beyond the normal time when this gate uh, would activate the branch, facilitates the propagation of the branch. 
what I think is also interesting is this, that we see an effect that's due to the intrinsic excitability of the cells, namely this adaptation. Uh, as I said, all the neurons here are adaptive exponential integrate and fire neurons. So even when you inject an excitatory uh, current into the cell, if this comes uh, sort of about 100 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds prior to the normal activation of the branch, you could potentially halt propagation through this network. And that's because you activate the cell and then the cell enters this adaptive state and then it is no longer possible to activate it, which means that if you don't activate the gate, you cannot activate the entire branch. We can do exactly the same type of analysis for the orange brand. So here I'm using one example of a network to illustrate, but we ran many, many simulations and we kind of computed average effects. And what I show you is very stereotypical for many of the networks that we examined for basically very different sizes of these, of these branches, of these uh, subsequences. So here again, we inject the current into the gate of the orange branch. And we see halting if this current is inhibitory and it occurs uh, before the activation of the branch normally. It can be facilitating if it's an excitatory and it can also be, uh, uh, it can also prevent propagation due to the adaptive effects of the cell if it comes about 100 to 50 milliseconds before the normal activation of the branch in the absence of this input. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So we have these three effects. And so we have control, at least, you know, we're doing these experiments in silico. So we have full control over when and how we can activate these individual branches, the orange and the green branch here by uh, controlling the amount of input that is injected in these gate cells for each, which we identify for each of the branches. The next question that arises is, what is important is to understand, so ultimately we're going to put them into the big network, but before we put them in the big network, we want to first see how they can interact. So here we did a, a different experiment where we now drive the gate of the other branch and look at the influence on the original branch. So here we drive the gate of the orange branch, uh, sorry, of the green branch, and we look at the effect on the orange branch. And we see completely no effect. Which, which tells us that the orange branch activation is completely independent of the green branch. So it doesn't matter whether activity propagates or halts in the green branch, it will not affect the propagation from the, uh, from the orange branch. But this is not always true for all the branches. In fact, if we do the opposite experiment and now we apply this current into the gate of the orange branch, we actually see substantial effects on the propagation through the uh, green branch. In fact, here we see that the orange branch tends to inhibit actually the, uh, the, the green branch. And so the branches may be gated independently as is the case of this orange branch, but they also may show interaction. So this is very exciting for us because it sort of looks like also what you see um, in, in experiments. So here, these are the experiments done in the Laurent department. They of course just did, I think they literally did seven time, uh, experiments like this. We did many, many more in our, in our um, networks. And we hope that, you know, they, for instance, did not know that uh, sequences are composed of subsequences that can be mapped to these branches. So these are insights that we have gained from our model. But let me just explain to you how kind of our model post hoc predicts or post dicts what they originally saw with their experiment. So here they activated two cells and they saw that if they, you know, in some of the trials, um, uh, they, you know, if they activate one of them, they basically see no spikes but they see follower cells if they activate both of them together. So the sequences clearly interact or you can have a different scenario where you have a lot of followers when the two, uh, where one of the two is activated, but basically you inhibit a bunch of the followers when you activate both of them at the same time. So this sort of confirms this idea that these branches can indeed interact. They can be independent, but they can also uh, interact with, which matches very nicely with experimental data. Are there any questions for now? So what have I done? I've explained to you this biologically plausible model with some parameters like intrinsic cell properties and some aspects of the connectivity constraint from the turtle data. I've shown you that we can generate sequences just like in the experimental data, but we can go beyond the experimental data in terms of predicting how both the excitatory and the inhibitory population will be involved in these sequences. And now I've shown you that we can actually cluster sequences into subsequences and that match the, or that can be mapped very nicely to sort of branches of strong connectivity 
And it looks like we can either independently route information through these branches or we can allow them to interact. And what I want to do in the last part of the talk is rather than doing this in a controlled way by identifying the gates and injecting currents by hand, I want to now look at what this means if we look at the whole network as a whole. So, so the network as a whole. So what happens if we put these, these um, branches or these subsequences kind of in the whole network, what can this tell us about you know, the capacity of information to go through these different paths? I don't have a lot of slides left. So are there any questions for now? Is, is at least the picture clear? Sort of, I hope so. Okay, okay, perfect. All right, so now let's look at how these um, multiple spikes can interact in this kind of natural setting in the recurrent network. So here we did two, two experiments. So here, um, again, this is experiments, I mean, in silico, because this has not been done in the model. And, and Jill, for example, is very interested in exploring what the, would this mean in the model. So here we picked, we were just curious, if you, uh, can, if, if you take two random cells in your network and you try to identify the sequences that you can trigger by, active, by injecting spike into one cell and injecting a spike in a completely different cell in the network, are you going to find sequences that intersect or are you just going to get you know, one sequence in, uh, triggered by one cell, another sequence triggered by the other cell without them intersecting? So what do you think is the answer? So the answer seems to be that actually they are very unlikely to intersect. If you just pick cells randomly uh, through, you know, ran if you pick these uh, trigger cells randomly in the network, two or three or many more, and if you look at what are the kind of the, the follower cells that participate in these sequences, you will see that they are completely independent. So if you tr trigger cell A, you trigger cell B, they evoke their own sequence and basically very few of the, the cells um, will, will participate to both sequences. So neurons are very unlikely to share followers if you trigger them. Then the next question we wanted to ask is, how do followers, do followers add up? So similar to this experiment that I mentioned they did uh, in, in, the, uh, in the ex vivo setup. So here we basically looked at the followers that correspond to activating just one of the cells or just the other cell or two of the cells together. And actually my student had this brilliant idea to divide up based on the findings that he uh, find, he, he clustered and he identified specific cells that he called or followers that he called core followers versus combination specific. So what, what does he mean by call core followers? So these are cells that always respond when you trigger A or B. Um, independent of whether you trigger just A or A together with B. So for example, these are the cells, these are shown in yellow. So if you trigger A, just A, you see the yellow followers. If you trigger A and B, basically these cells don't care that you have simultaneously triggered B. They just care that you have triggered A. So they are core followers to the activation of the cell A. Similarly, we have these light pink uh, that only care about the activation of cell B. So they get activated when you just trigger B or when you trigger B together with A. They just don't care that you also trigger A at the same time. So these are core followers that are specific to a, a, given, a given trigger cell. But more interestingly, he identified quite a few followers that he called combination specific that really care exactly which cell you trigger. So here are these purple cells that only care when you activate A these red ones that only care when you activate B, and others, these green ones that only care when you activate A and B. And this is one example, but we ran multiple simulations and we found such combination specific followers in many, many examples. And so we think that this suggests a highly combinatorial capacity to basically define followers or reliable responses from just a few triggers. So you can effectively have any kind of response. You have only two triggers, A and B, by, by, but by determining whether you will trigger one or the other, or you leave one or the other silent, you can have you know, an incredible combinatorial capacity to determine um, who will get activated and who will not. Okay, um, the next question is, okay, sorry, this is what I explained. Um, 
so what when we put these into networks right so so far i just showed you uh you know i showed you we pick the gates and then we inject the current into the gate for the green or for the orange branch but of course um you know uh, you have this happening naturally in the network so this 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 uh, scheme that i showed you here of these strongly connected cells is embedded in a much larger network with many other weak connections and also many other strong connections that is experiencing ongoing activity uh, we drive it through this random current but in real life of course the animal is experiencing sensor inputs changes in internal state and so on so there's a lot of change in, in contextual information so this activation of the gates and this natural routing of information are happening as the animal is undergoing all of this all of this experience and so we wanted to understand this so what is how does this context that is provided by the sensory environment or by internal state of the animal how does this influence um, whether you know you activate these gates or not how does it influence the propagation that you might expect to see through these branches so we're effectively fixing you know a tiny part of the context in which the sequence happens compared to previously where, where all the input was random. So we actually find that most of these contextual neurons um, excite or inhibit both of these sub-networks, in this case, in this example, the green and the orange equally. So this is what we see here by this diagonal trend. Um, so as we showed, so we actually have quite a bit of lateral inhibition in the circuit. And so we find that about 90% of the cells, so these are the ones that below here, uh, that fall here in the lower uh, left quadrant. And about 90% of the cells um, cause inhibition to both uh, sub-networks. So what do we have here? What, what are we plotting here? Here we're plotting trials in which one branch is active trials in which another branch is active that are uh, basically uh, just looking at whether activity can propagate through one or the other branch so uh, but we have very very few cases where we have lateral excitation so these are basically cases where uh, we have both um, the activation of both of these sequences and even fewer cases about three percent of cases that fall in this upper left or lower right quadrant um, that we call basically uh, so about three percent of the cases where the neurons can selectively facilitate one branch while while halting the other so here we promote branch a and we gate or we halt branch b for in this quadrant and in this case the opposite happens here we promote branch b but we halt branch a so uh, given what I showed you on the previous slide, we think that these are basically combination specific and they're very selective to uh, a small number of these um, additional triggers that provide the context. Okay, this is this is the other quadrant. So that's it. So what I, I'm going to end here. What I want to what I have shown you today is that we have built a biologically inspired network model using this available data from the turtle cortex uh, based on some heroic experiments of, I don't know, over 2000 patched cells in the, in the slab uh, of the turtle cortex as vivo, which gave us the ability to constrain single neural properties and connectivity, but otherwise left the networks pretty, uh, pretty random. Um, the key ingredient that we found to capture the propagation of sequences in these models was the strong connections. Remember, these are the, the right tail of the distribution of probability distribution of connections and these are very sparse so you don't have a lot of strong connections but they are key and they're important for the generation of these reliable sequences but they are not uh, the whole story weak connections are also important because they basically modulate uh, these these sequences so modulate the reliability of the sequences and therefore we think that they sort of provide some flexibility so as I showed you you know if we have our recurrent network of excitation inhibitor neurons it is these weak connections that in some sense provide context that enable the sequences to be reliable but still a little bit different from one trial to another um, sort of by using, by being kind of digging deeper into the activity as well as the branches, so the connectivity in these networks, we were able to sort of identify that sequences are composed of subsequences that can be mapped to these individual branches, and that uh, we can, we could identify these gates 
into these into these branches that we think are uh, naturally activated, you know, during normal sensory experience or changes of internal state of the animal. And they are the ones that would enable for a sequence to sort of change its course and involve one branch or another. So for example, in trial one, you have the purple trigger cell that routes activity in this direction. So it activates the brown, the orange, the yellow cell, the uh, the let's say a gate cell is this orange cell, which may be facilitated, uh, but this other gate cell into another branch is halted and therefore activity doesn't go through this um, other branch. On the other hand, in trial two, you still get this, this brown cell to activate, but then activity rather than going through this original branch, this is now halted. It actually goes in a different direction because the gate to another branch is, is facilitated. So these branches of strong connections can indeed be uh, routed or can be gated to route activity through these different branches. So uh, that's where I'm gonna end. I know I've been a bit open-ended as to what this propagation or routing of activity may mean, but there is actually quite a bit of literature out there. I think Larry Abbott and Tim Fogel's actually worked on some of these issues. Maybe also Francis, if you were at Brandeis at the same time, they were actually, looking at how one can, they did a slightly different approach. They were embedding SIM fire chains into recurrent networks. So they were sort of putting in structured connectivity. Uh, but the idea was that if you have sequences, they were looking at how one can implement logic gates. So we haven't taken that step. We haven't looked at how this routing information, what it could imply for the implementation of say logic gates, but we have basically argued that you don't need structured connectivity. You know, There's nothing structured in the connectivity here. We just have these, strong and sparse connections in the midst of many, many weak connections um, that naturally happen to form these branches that can be gated, uh, which can route activity in different paths. So I'm gonna end here. Sorry, that was a little bit longer. We started a bit late. Uh, I hope there's still people attending. <laughs> so yeah, ask me anything. Uh, I want to thank my group and especially Louis. Where is Louis? Louis is here who did most of this work that I presented today. And he's now actually um, dwelling more into the lizard uh, or into the reptilian cortex, looking at lizard data. So he's really, it's been a pleasure to be able to collaborate with the, the lab of Gilles Laurent and their exciting and unusual data. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you very much. <laughs> so I, no questions, but I'm going to let other people go first. And I see Maurizio has his hand up. Um, so go ahead, Maurizio. Hi, Juliana. Can you hear me? Ah, hi, Maurizio. How are you? How are you? <laughs> Very good. Ah, we did so... with Paul together in 2000 and... <laughs> 2009, yes. Nine, and you yes. have my student that just left on a neuro match. I'm sorry I can't really show up, but no I figured it out. My, my webcam on this window machine doesn't work. So <clears throat> I have a couple of questions concerning your nice work. So the first question is, I know you say it unstructured, right? So mm -hmm. I guess, uh, what can you say about the loops that you by chance might have inside your, your network? Do you mm -hmm. actually have loops or not? We don't have loops. Uh, I don't know if I have a, let me see. I'm gonna stop sharing. Let me see if I find a different presentation. Uh, so what we don't have any any loops that are right. put in by hand, but what we do have, let me see if there's a different talk. My student tried to identify motifs that are traversed by these sequences that are most frequently traversed. But again, it, this is not hard coded because everything, as I said, is just random. So the only thing that we have are strong connections that are yeah, sparse and, and otherwise random. But they're still, let me see if I find sure. it. Um, but there are indeed some motifs that are more or less. Uh, yeah. I, I, I guess that my question was then related to the fact. So when you do have this kind of model, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you actually observe a spontaneous activity or do you have actually to? To, to, to stimulate them exactly to, to have uh, activity. So there is, a, there is a little bit of spontaneous activity, hmm. uh, but it's very weak. As I said, we were aiming to get these, uh, we were aiming to get these super low firing rates in the system. Let me show you. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
<clears throat> so I can show you. This is a very old presentation, so it's not very updated. But let me just show you. I don't know if this runs. This is what activity looks like. Let's see. Can you see it? Sure, sure. I can. You can see this, yeah. So what should I look at here? So, so this is the we, network. So, so let's look at space. So this okay. is what activity looks like in space. So um, I believe here a single spike in the in the in the middle where you see the red, uh, the red. Um, circle so and there is activity. there is some background noise, I believe, right? Yeah, so, okay. all the neurons are receiving this. DC current and, and okay, some, there some is. spontaneous firing rate, exactly. Okay, so there's okay. very, very weak, but the average firing rate of a given cell is indeed like 0 0.01, 0 0.02 hertz. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, and so then uh, I guess uh, the, the interesting question is, so so you you come up with these, uh, with this kind of, of network, right? So you don't build this network by some exactly. kind of development. So... Mm how these networks do they actually exist do you have some proof yeah. that is the connectivity yeah. is like this and how would you build this network yeah. naturally okay let me just answer this question so again this is an old presentation there might be an updated figure of this in, in our manuscript but still what my student here did is exactly the question that you asked about the motif so again the motifs are not put in by hand but he still looked from the reference spike he sort of did and it's very difficult we've, we've gone through several versions of portraying or illustrating how activity propagates in the network. So in this particular version, he's putting time on the x-axis and you see the spikes that are generated in the sequence. And then he's color coding connections in these three regimes. The weak ones are in blue, the strong ones are in orange and the mid-level connections are in yellow. Yes. And so you basically look at, if you trigger the spike, how activity propagates through these different motifs in the network. And so he compared these two scenarios, the low activity and the high activity, and then looked at motifs that are indeed responsible for the generation of the spikes for excitatory to excitatory or excitatory to inhibitory cells. And let me yeah. see what conclusion I wrote here. I don't know. Well, they don't look yeah. like uh, loops, right? They always look no, like they don't look like forward, loops. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I think the yeah the important the important one is that for the excitatory cells, the most relevant motif for the propagation of activity is just single neuron to single neuron. So you need a strong connection that goes from one neuron to another, and that is enough to propagate the excitatory one. For the inhibitory ones, we actually see these convergent motifs to be more relevant. So where you have sort of one going to two and then converging back to one. Mm -hmm. And again, we think that this makes sense because we have very few inhibitory neurons, about 7%, but the connectivity is quite dense. So 50-50, percent excitatory to inhibitory so it's like inhibition is very promiscuous yes. it like really receives a lot of input and it gives away a lot of input so these convergent motifs are not surprising but you're right there's no connectivity put in by hand um, and then you ask the question about so we, the second question was about how this connectivity could emerge or does it exist right. in the network? exactly so like does it exist yeah, yeah okay so does it exist I think this is very difficult to answer because, um, I mean, unless we do EM, right, electron microscopy, and they really a look standard at standard connectomics, right? Yeah, right, standard connectomics, we will not know that connectivity is random, right? So in our in our model, we made this assumption explicitly because we wanted to we wanted to be different than other studies that have explicitly embedded structures into random networks and then look at what they do and we wanted to say well what if you put in some biological detail but otherwise you didn't embed any structure can some structure still emerge purely from kind of mostly random looking networks so that was what we wanted to do in the first place whether this is true or not i don't know but you then ask the second question can this self-organize into a state that we see and we have a related project that is led by a different phd student who is asking exactly that given this data uh, that we have these log normal distributions so these mm -hmm. types of uh, connection strengths here given this data that we have these long tails where we have very few but still prominent strong and sparse connections um, can we have, and we know that they're important as we've uh, found out in this particular study, 
can we uh, have a way to generate them from plasticity mechanisms? So yes. we have sort of a self-organizing study now where we put in, I mean, it's a, I don't know if I should say this, <laughs> To me, it's been a little bit dissatisfying because we, we are managing to get these long tail distributions of connections, but we're needing a lot of ingredients and it's proving very difficult to identify the minimal set of ingredients to generate yes, yes. These, uh, these long uh, tails. But still, it's very, it's very interesting. So uh, and I, I left it here because then I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm actually on your same time zone. I'm not there. So I, I guess because it's snowing in Toronto, so I decided to come to the spring in Italy. But besides, <laughs> besides, besides that, uh, I think what has chanced me, and I was looking at your graphs in terms of, uh, you know, the more or less the frequency curve versus either mean yeah. input. Or, so my understanding over there is that eventually, right, your your firing rate eventually still saturates to very low value, like uh, I would say yeah. probably less than one hertz. So, so yeah. you are you you take the you take the turtle. The turtle, I would say, it's a no. very unique uh, organism, right? Because it's very yeah. slow. So the metabolism of the turtle is extremely slow in general. Nevertheless, would you argue that the fact that, that this neuron fires slow is actually a result of the fact that you have this very sparse connectivity in your brain. And so the sparse connectivity here mm. complies to metabolic requirements or is actually the individual neuron properties that I believe you didn't consider here because mm. you take a yeah. standard, standard neuron, standard mm. integrate and fire. And these neural property are actually mm. somehow changing. Mm. Yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. And to be completely honest, we haven't thought about it, but it's an excellent question. What we have been worrying a lot about is, you know, we wanted to, we, we, we still aim and want to make the study more general than just the turtle cortex. And so in that sense, we are really trying to make the case that although our model is inspired by the turtle cortex, the things that we're trying to explain, like the sequences from single spikes, they have been seen like uh, also, what's his name? Um, Michael Brecht showed something similar in the red cortex. You can put in a spike and you can a single spike and you can even affect uh, behavior mm -hmm. in rats. So we're trying to argue that this is a much more general effect that pertains to other brain areas because these sequences evoke from single spikes or propagation of activity from single spikes are seen everywhere. But we have been worried a little bit that sort of one of the goals that we had that really make this different than other models that are the low firing rates. So because that's what is seen in the cortex of the turtles is indeed actually a bit of a fault of the model. Because we, we, we thought, well, all these other circuits where we try to you know, use our model to kind of explain that our circuit applies to, don't have such low firing rates, right? The hippocampus, the sensory cortex in rodents, they, the rates are not so low. So we have been worried about that aspect, how to make our results apply to these other cases where the firing rates are not so low. But what you raise is a related point which we haven't thought about is what could underlie the low firing rates and could this be, or could the fact that we are looking at turtle cortex where metabolism is indeed very slow or maybe different types of you know, considerations as far as how neurons are designed and how networks are designed may apply could be the reason for the low firing rates. That's a really interesting question. And I don't know, we have not thought about it. And it's a, yeah, I think it's worthwhile to see if it is, yeah, really a network property. Is it mm -hmm. maybe the sparse strong connections, the fact that they are sparse or the single neuron properties that are different? I would suspect it's not the network properties because, I mean, there are now some EM studies, I forget mm. it's a preprint uh, where they do indeed measure very few strong connections in another brain area. Uh, but still in the sauropsids or like in the in the reptiles or, or no no in in, in mammalian species in mammalians. they actually say yeah they actually try to they don't fit a single like log normal distribution they fit like a mixture of gaussians so in, in log space they fit two gaussians and so they actually argue it's we use a continuum so many weak mm -hmm. and then a few medium and then very very few strong and they actually argue in, in log space it's kind of a mixture of two gaussians so just weak and just strong and that you don't actually have intermediate but they do show that it's um uh, it, it's a big 
maybe I don't know if Clay Reed or Sebastian Song or uh, okay, uh, it's good if you. I, I probably think or Andreas Tolias. Uh, yeah. Anyways, one of those three people, three big people who do current economics. <laughs> I think they, they, they argue that it is the strong connections that are there in rodent cortex. So I, okay. I think this is not unusual. And people like Georgi Bujaki have been arguing mm -hmm. for a really long time that you have low normal distributions of firing rates, so not of connections, but of firing rates. So I think they are there. But what is peculiar about the turtle cortex, I have no idea. Maybe it is the single learn properties. Maybe it's something to do about how the neurons look like. I know that like their axons are really, really long. Like they can they have mm. like so much cable like length that I don't know. But maybe I'll ask Jill about this and see what he thinks. It's a good well, question. Regardless, <laughs> very, very nice, very interesting work. So congrats. Very nice. Thanks. Uh, I'm done. So I leave the others, <laughs> uh, the, the audio. And thank you. I have to leave, Juliana. So thank you very thank you. much. No, and yeah. I, I love, uh, are you coming by chance to Australia for OCNS this year? Or no, no, no. I think with yeah. the whole COVID crisis and yeah. And the stuff. I'm right? not I have a young family and I try to really limit my, my well, travel. Well, next year. <laughs> but I next... hope to see you somewhere oh, so, else. Oh, so there is a kid in the meantime. Okay. Okay. Ooh, Congratulations. Me too. Before you, before you, I just, before I'm people, sorry. I just there want is... to like actually thank like before everybody like, people have to go I'm going to keep talking but just to like officially thank thank uh, Yulia for a fantastic thank talk you. And <laughs> thank talk. You. so let's give her a round of applause before thank you very much <laughs> thank bye you. Juliana see you later <laughs> okay so I'm, I'm going to turn off the recording but I'm going to stay in chat so let me just turn off the recording I have several questions but you know people don't I know people have to go we officially ended no, 11 no, so well, yeah so, I mean,